so hi everyone uh, in the last lecture we just got introduced to the structure of this course and the textbooks and the scheme of evaluation etc today we are going to start with some revision of some of the very basic hardware concepts and uh, some introductory concepts of the operating systems uh, there is a quiz on Moodle. Uh, I request all of you to uh, open a new tab in your laptop or your mobile phone and keep it running. Uh, I'll keep asking questions and uh, you'll be expected to answer the questions which are asked on the Moodle quiz. So what we are going to do today is we will try to understand, um, although at just a higher level, how a computer system is built. Basically, with the hardware, with the operating system and something called a system programs on top of it. So I should just uh, make you aware that understanding how a computer system is built is uh, often more like solving a jigsaw puzzle. And um, uh, very often a linear treatment of the topics uh, helps us understand it better. But I find it uh, particularly uh, you know, a uh, fact of life, uh, which is seen quite often, that most of the topics cannot be treated in a linear fashion, but in a zigzag fashion. And uh, more like, you know, solving a jigsaw puzzle. You have to keep fitting in pieces together until the picture is complete. Although I'll try my best, and the textbook also tries its best to uh, cover things in a linear fashion. So we keep revisiting, you know, the different concepts again and again, and keep going deeper and deeper. So let's begin with something like a hardware. And uh, I'm sure you know you have seen a desktop before in your life. And uh, this is a picture of a backside of a typical desktop. And I'm sure you know you have seen this in your first year in your um, uh, workshop on computers. And you should be able to identify certain parts that are being shown here. Now, obviously, I don't have a quiz uh, on this particular thing. But um, let me just, you know, tell you about some of the things that you see here on this particular screen. So this is power supply. I'm sure all of you know this. And this thing which you see here is a fan. Basically, the outlet for a fan. The fan is inside. So can somebody write in the chat box, like, why is there a fan here? And somebody tried to write, why is there a fan here? And multiple answers are fine. Different answers is also fine. To cool down to whom? The, the user? <laughs> cool down what? Uh, to cool the processor, right? So the CPU, uh, because the processor, the CPU keeps running all the time. It keeps getting heated. And in order to cool it, the fan is there. Uh, by circulating air, the fan will try to cool the inside of this box. Uh, then I guess you can very easily relate to what you see here. And this is the Ethernet port to which you most typically connect the uh, Ethernet wire. Uh, and there are USB ports here, as you can see, USB ports. This is where you connect your monitor. This is called a VGA port. There are a lot of ports here which are not to be seen on a most typical computer today. So this is the old diagram. These two are what we called as the PS2 ports and to which you could connect mouse and keyboard where the cable was not USB but a cable called PS2 and so on. And there is a parallel port and there is a serial port on, port on this which we'll skip right now because most of the things today are connectable using a USB port. So you will see a lot of USB ports on desktops and at least two or three on laptops today. If you look inside it, and I'm sure you have seen inside a computer, then uh, you will see something like this, you know, uh, motherboard, you know, so this particular base is the motherboard. All of this is the motherboard. And you will basically see some chips like this. See, there's a chip here, there's a chip here, and the small chip, and the small chips, a lot of small chips and so on. And uh, another fan, so this is not the same fan which we saw, this is another fan. This fan is actually sitting on top of what we call as the processor. So if you really want to see your i3, i5 processor, you'll have to remove this particular fan. And below it, you will actually find the processor. And there are a lot of other things also on this particular thing. So for example, you can see there is this particular cable 
which is floating and you will see that it will basically connect to uh, either a hard disk or a cd rom and you will see as you can see here some vertical chips like this chip you know, which are basically the ram chip so you will see that the ram the processor and the uh, uh, hard disk and the cd rom they are all connected to this motherboard okay so all of that is connected to this particular motherboard and on motherboard also if you observe carefully uh, you will see various uh, yellow kind of strips going on which are basically nothing but set of wires connecting various devices together on the motherboard now what is the cpu or the processor you know what we call as i3 i5 etc so as we know it's a brain of the computer and which keeps running machine instructions it's the actual computer isn't it so without a processor there is no computer everything else is uh, a peripheral it's the cpu processor core which is actually the computer which does the job of computation running instructions the speeds of these processors today are in gigahertz i'm sure all of you know this so now i have a first question in the quiz on moodle and let me keep running start the quiz so i'm sure you will see the question on the screen now just now we said that the cpu is running instructions right and the question i'm asking you is where are those instructions stored okay the instructions that the cpu keeps running where are they stored you can answer i'll keep waiting for your responses so good there are 11 people who are yet to answer so some 57 people have said ram and uh, 12 people have said hard disk and uh, the answer is ram it's not hard disk so i think it is good if you know now that it's not stored in the hard disk okay so the instructions are actually stored only in the ram and nowhere else uh, good to see that nobody said keyboard mouse and screen uh, but hard disk is not correct the instructions are always the instructions that the cpu runs are always there only in the ram not on the hard disk good so what is there on the motherboard so this is another schematic diagram of a motherboard uh, again a slightly older versions of the motherboard but it really doesn't matter older or newer because the basic concepts remain the same so you will see that uh, there is a kind of socket you know in which the processor can fit in and different processors will have some pins different so only one particular processor will normally fit in one particular type of processor socket on top of this here actually the fan will sit okay the fan which we have seen now these are the holders for the particular fan then you will actually see you know all these ports which become visible on the outside so when you put a cover on top of it only these ports are visible from outside like the usb port the ethernet port and vga port and parallel port and so on you will see that there are slots like this you know there is a notch like this here as you can see there are notches and within the notches there are these slots into which goes what we call as the ram chips and you can insert ram chips here onto the motherboard what is a ram uh, so whenever we say memory please understand we mean the ram we don't mean anything else so i have seen often some students refer to the hard disk as the memory no we don't call hard disk as memory hard disk is hard disk whenever we say memory we only mean the ram the random access memory now why is the ram called as random access memory so it is called random access memory because access to any location takes the same time so let us say this is the ram chip and let us say this is the 4 gb ram chip then accessing the byte number 0 or accessing the byte number 1 million or accessing the byte number and thousand million will take the same time okay so that is why it is called random access you can access any location randomly in the same time now as all of you know it's a semiconductor device and i'm sure all of you know and yesterday only you replied that the ram is a volatile device so the contents of the ram will vanish the moment the power is turned off so this basically now leads to a lot of problems and interesting answers because the ram is volatile if at all you know the cpu wants to run instructions from the ram and just now we saw the answer to the question 
that the instruction that the CPU stores are there in the RAM. Before the CPU can even run those instructions, they have to be brought into the RAM. And we need to understand how are they brought into the RAM. Like suppose right now I'm running this LibreOffice software. So my processor is right now running the instructions of the LibreOffice software. So how did the LibreOffice come into the RAM? That is the question to which we will find the answer in this course. So I will repeat once again in summary, you know what I said just now. We saw just now that the instructions that the CPU runs are in the RAM. So we need to understand how do, do those instructions come into the RAM, you know? And that is the question to which we'll find an answer in this particular course. So the next question again I have for all of you is, can I add more RAM to a computer? Okay, can I add more RAM to a computer? So there are options on which you have to think and uh, all right so some people giving one answer i'm waiting for other answers uh, okay i think i should share the complete screen so you can also see the answers that are being given So, okay, I should not show the answers right now. Let's wait for a few seconds uh, because I don't want to influence your answers. So I think the time is over. So let's see some 50, say five people said yes. All right, you can, that is correct answer. And some one person, two persons, one person, two, three persons have given these answers. All of them are wrong, okay? Yeah, there is no co-relationship between the hard disk and the RAM. You can replace any one of them independently of the other. And definitely it is replaceable only if you have a slot. Okay, there, there are multiple slots. Normally laptops uh, carry two slots. Okay, and there are laptops which carry only one slot. And if there's only one slot, then all you have to do is throw away the existing chip and buy a new chip of a higher capacity. But you can replace the memory normally. So that is normally possible to replace the RAM in on your computer. Now let us come to the hard drive. Okay. And uh, this is a picture of a hard drive of a desktop, not a laptop. The laptop hard drives are very small, Some, you know, almost uh, one fifth the size of this particular hard drive. So the hard drive looks like a metal big case. And if you ever manage to open hard drive, if you really want to open it, you can come to me. I have, you know, some old bad hard drives lying with me. We can actually open and see inside this hard drive. I have always found it fun to see inside these devices. So if you open it and see inside, you will see that there are a lot of these, you know, circular platters, you know. So what you see here is only the top of this. Below this, there are multiple of this sort. And you will see that this is the spindle around which it will rotate, keep rotate. And this thing is called as a head. Okay. So the job of this head, this head is a magnetic device. And this particular platter that you see here is also made up of a lot of magnetic devices. So basically, uh, through the physics of magnetism, the head and the you know the tiny bits of information stored on the platter they will interact and information can be uh, stored or retrieved from uh, this particular storage mechanism uh, this is a you know zoomed in version of the same thing so you can see here this is the spindle and these are the magnetic disks that i was talking about and this is the head so the head can actually move like this you know and uh, read different parts of the disk and uh, this keeps spinning okay so different parts of it can be brought under the head and the ha head can move around to actually read information from different parts of the uh, the spin the, the tracks so schematically each of uh, these magnetic disks they are divided into tracks and sectors and cylinders as shown in this particular diagram and uh, very often this Head is not one, but there are multiple heads in a kind of arm assembly and one head for uh, every platter and, you know, multiple heads can read parallelly from the hard disk. So now understand this because this thing rotates, it's a mechanical device. And remember all mechanical devices are slow. They are very slow compared to semiconductor devices. So the hard drive is essentially a very slow device. The hard drive is magnetic. On hard drive, what happens is that, you know, this 
magnetic platters they are divided into tiny magnetic spots each representing a one or zero the physics is obviously you know the two orientations of a magnet uh, as you know the magnet is a north pole and south pole and you just flip the orientations and you get a zero or a one the hard drive is persistent because as you know magnetism itself is persistent so uh, the hard disk is a persistent storage whatever is stored on it gets stored permanently so uh, and the hard drive is very very slow now there are different uh, interfacing mechanisms for connecting a hard drive to the motherboard different type of cables and different type of communication protocols on the particular cable and they are given names like id sata scsi pata and sas and so on uh, this is a homework for all of you to at least get introduced to these acronyms and know a little bit about technological aspects of all of this for example how does the cable look like what are the typical speeds of the hard drives that are supported by these different technologies where is a particular type of disk most typically used in a desktop or in a server or a blade server or what kind of you know computers uh, they are most typically used in so this is your homework please do this now we come to a very important diagram and i want all of you to thoroughly memorize this diagram and conceptually understand this diagram you know very deeply so this diagram is the diagram of what we call as the storage device hierarchy now it so happens that there are variety of types of devices for storing data digitally what do we mean by storing data digitally we mean basically storing data encoded in the binary format 1 and 0 and there are a lot of devices which can actually help us do that so just now we saw two of them we saw a hard drive and we saw the main memory the ram now ram is a semiconductor device as we discussed just now and uh, using some uh, electronic physics it will store the binary data we saw how the hard drive works it's a mechanical device and so on now interestingly uh, there is this uh, give and take in the hierarchy of storage devices as we know main memory the semiconductor device it's fast but it's volatile its contents will get erased when the power is turned off well the hard disk is permanent storage but it is slow so it's a mechanical device now there are other devices also apart from the main memory and the hard drive for example there's optical disk optical disk is what we normally call a cd and dvd now the contents of cd and dvd are also permanent but then it is actually a device which is even slower than the hard drive the hard, the, the cd and the dvd then there are magnetic tapes also which i think most of you might not have even seen but uh, uh, let me tell you even today magnetic tapes are actually used by certain organizations to store data uh, how does a magnetic tape look like uh, it's just a tape you know if you have seen an audio cassette and the old type of audio cassette players and if you have not seen just do a web search and you will see the diagram uh, the images of those so those are magnetic tapes and uh, they could also be used to store data they were also persistent storage but then even slower than the optical disk now the slowness comes from the physics of it okay the way these devices operate the way the hardware uh, uh, is built so that is what determines their speed and uh, if you can recollect the concepts you have studied in computer organization you will recollect these two words the resistors and cache so cache is a small memory which is present on the cpu chip actually so main memory ram we have seen in the diagram of the motherboard is a separate chip okay which you attach into the motherboard and it gets connected to the processor through set of wires called bus but the cache is a memory which is on the processor chip itself and that is why the cache is more fast but the cache is also volatile and then there are resistors and i'm sure all of you know resistors you have done some assembly coding in your life so you know what are the resistors the resistors are even fewer in number but I, but they are extremely extremely fast because they are part of the core of the cpu chip so they are very core to the processing components of the processor 
and that is why the resistors are very fast even faster compared to the cache now it so happens that these top 3 are volatile and all these bottom 4 are non volatile but the speed decreases as you come downwards and the volatility increases as you go upward so this is the problem actually you know there is a give and take that if you want to have faster speed you approach the volatile storage and if you want to have persistence then you have to be content with a slower device now why is this slide this diagram very important because the way computer systems are built the way an operating system is built the design of an operating system the particular choices of solutions that we make when designing an operating system lot of algorithms of the operating system lot of data structures of the operating system are actually driven by this particular fact of life that there exists a storage device hierarchy few more quantitatively the differences between the different types of storages and all these diagrams are basically taken from your textbook so you should start reading the chapter 1 of the textbook now so if you look at the registers then most typically the registers are less than 1 kilobyte in size and there are typically 8 12 16 maybe 128 up to those many registers okay not more than that depending on which processor you have how are the registers implemented so basically uh, they are kind of cmos technology which is a custom memory with multiple ports on the cpu itself access time of the registers is very very fast in almost 0.2 to 0.5 nanoseconds and uh, if you look at the cache so right now we are going to ignore these two parts we will discuss them so if you look at the cache cache sizes are typically 16 mb on uh, 32 mb 64 mb caches come in those sizes some mbs okay and caches can be on chip they can also be off chip but most typically they are on chip the size to access a cache is if you can compare these two numbers then at least order of magnitude more okay at least 10 times more so from 0.5 to 25 seconds so that's a large difference here uh so that is the cache main memory is mostly nowadays in some gigabytes and uh, uh computers can have 4 gb ram 8 gb ram like for example the moodle server that we run has a 32 gb ram so most typically memory main memory sizes are in certain number of gbs and uh, it's a cmos uh, sram technology which is used for implementing main memory access time the most important characteristic is in 80 to 250 nanoseconds so now you can see the again a jump of order of magnitude here then nowadays you have what is called as the solid state disk the ssds and uh, this is a kind of non volatile storage which is very fast very fast compared to the other non volatile storages so in earlier diagram also there was a non volatile storage an example of that is a solid state disk ssds and i'm sure you are aware that today you can purchase ssd storage laptops uh, at a relatively affordable cost and the sizes of these are mostly some 256 gb 512 gb up to 1 tb and so on but the access time once again you can see there is a jump of order of magnitude so now this is 25000 nanosecond so that is typically 25 microsecond from nanosecond we come to the arena of now microsecond 25 microsecond to 50 microsecond that is a jump you experience and then there are hard disk hard disk can be up to terabytes but the hard disk as you can see here work in millisecond time frame so if you want to access data from hard disk you have to be prepared to spend some millisecond of time now for humans millisecond may be a very very small insignificant time but for computers where your processor runs in gigahertz and gigahertz is the range of nanoseconds actually you know every clock cycle that happens inside your cpu is to be measured in nanoseconds so compared to nanosecond millisecond is a million times slower thing so magnetic disk that is why we say are extremely extremely slow now let us come to this part okay the manage by part and it is actually this part which we are going to understand in much much deeper detail in this particular course 
first of all we are going to understand what is meant by managed by you know because this word itself is very vague managed by so when we say the register is managed by compiler here or the cache is managed by the hardware or the main memory solid state disk and magnetic disk by operating system what does it mean what do they do with it you know so i'll just emphasize this that the concept of managing here is actually different for all these different type of storage devices there is just a generic word manage used by but the way a compiler manages a register or the hardware manages cache or the operating system manages the memory or hard disk are quite different yes the, the point here is correct that they are managed by these different things but we are going to actually understand why there are different components of the computer system which manage different type of storage and how do they do it okay that is what we are going to understand now the last point here is backed by and all you can see is you know there is a very clear cut sequential backed up by linkage here every device we say is backed up by a device which is slower than that once again you know throughout this course we will keep learning how is this backing up actually done and why is it done what is the need for this particular backing up now i'll pause and i'll wait for questions if there are any so i'm just taking a pause and i'm waiting for some questions that may come from your side and feel free to ask any question it may be a very simple question a question about any basic concept from microprocessor or co or anything is the answer to your question rohit is yes you have ssd is better than 1 tb also i think it's only that they are very very costly so maybe when this book and this particular image was drawn that time maybe ssds were up to only 1 tb available but you know no kind of diagram will be perfectly correct because the storage thing keeps changing so fast that uh, you know no textbook can keep up to date with the most recent data about the storage speeds and the storage sizes but that is fine so basically we have to understand the concept yeah, that is the storage hierarchy and the speeds and the sizes of the storages they are actually inversely related to each other so most interestingly now if you look at it the very important factor is the cost the money that you have to pay for all these storage devices and if you will very easily appreciate this fact that the hard disk is the cheapest ssd is costlier ram is even more costlier and the cache and uh, registers which actually they are not sold separately they come with the processor but any processor with more registers and more cache will be more costly processor so the price actually increases in the in the increasing order of the speed of access of the device Yes, I'll wait for one more minute. All right, fine. So let's move ahead. so i'm sure many of you might have already known lot of these concepts but i find it very important to do a overview of these concepts before we jump into the domain of os now you have studied a diagram of this sort in your computer organization okay the way the cpu and the peripheral devices and the ram etc are connected to each other inside your cpu box this is a schematic diagram of a modern computer system so as you can see in this diagram the processor of the cpu and all the io devices like desk mouse keyboard printer monitor and also the ram they are basically connected through you know this thing which is basically what we call as the bus the bus is nothing but a set of wires with a protocol on it in order to transfer data so another thing important is that whenever you purchase a disk the disk actually comes bundled with what is called as a disk controller 
so these things which are shown separately here they are both inside the disk box so once again i'll repeat if you have seen the metallic box of the disk then not only the disk that is the spindle and the head and the moving assembly but it also comes with a uh, uh, electronic device called the disk controller which is actually more of a converter from the mechanical to the digital world i hope you understand it very easily because the disk if you say is a mechanical device then you need to convert the physics of mechanical world into the physics of the electronic world and the job of one job actually not all the job one job of the disk controller is actually to do that okay so convert digital data into mechanical instructions and so on similarly all other devices like the mouse and the keyboard and the printer the very device itself comes with a controller inside it so this particular keyboard will have another small electronic component ultimately which becomes the interface between the digital world and the mechanical world and the job of these controllers which are part of the hardware device itself is to you know create an ability so that the device can communicate over this shared bus okay so the all these controllers will know how to talk on the bus okay they are hardware devices remember they are hardware devices they are not software devices so all this logic of the ability to send data to send per certain control signals on the bus is inbuilt into all these hardware devices now this diagram uh, kind of gives an impression sometimes a wrong impression that because all of them are connected to each other all of them can actually talk to each other uh, symmetrically which is obviously not correct so rem remember your monitor is never going to talk to the mouse your disk is never going to talk to the monitor and i am saying this because i have observed that this type of a diagram leads to the confusion that my disk can talk to the monitor or my monitor can talk uh, to the keyboard and so on no that is not correct that doesn't happen then what happens the processor the cpu can transfer data between itself and ram only even though on the diagram you see they are all connected but the communication of the processor is happening only with the ram actually there is no data transfer between the cpu and the hard disk cpu and the keyboard cpu and the mouse and forget any data transfer between the io devices themselves there is no data transfer between the keyboard and the mouse and the mouse and the screen so no it doesn't happen so only data transfer that are possible is something like this if your io devices want to transfer data then they have to transfer the data to the memory and then the cpu will access the data from the memory so the memory the ram you will see is a very very centralizing figure in this whole architecture the data has to be in the ram okay the io devices the keyboard mouse disk all of them will either store or fetch the data from the memory and same is with the processor processor will also store the data into the memory and fetch from the memory that is how this whole uh, uh, you know computer organization actually works so another diagram which basically explains the essentially the same concept that i said but this is what we call as the von neumann architecture and all your computers today from your laptop to desktop to mobile phone to a server to mainframe to super computers all of them essentially follow this architecture they may be different in their speeds and capacities and so on but the essential organization of the computer is same as i have shown earlier and the architecture of the cpu is the same what does this diagram say this is the cpu all right the cpu has a cache as you can see here the cache is on the cpu chip oops sorry this is the ram the memory now as i said just now the processor can talk to the ram okay when we said where are the instructions stored that the cpu executes they are stored here in the ram so what will the cpu do cpu will fetch them the cpu will fetch those instructions and execute those instructions now for executing instructions it is possible that you need some data for example you have to do addition instruction but the two numbers that are to be added 
they have to be obtained by the cpu and those numbers that is the data is also stored in the ram so basically there is a continuous movement of instructions and data from the ram into the cpu your devices like the hard disk actually talk to the memory using mechanisms like what is called as dma and i'm sure you have studied the concept of dma uh, in computer organization if you have not okay then you can just write in the chat box that no i have not studied dma and i'll try to cover some basic concepts of D dma in one of the subsequent lectures so you just keep mention this in the chat box that we need to discuss dma what is possible though you know between the cpu and the io devices okay so it is not that there is no interaction of the cpu with the io devices okay certain small io requests and certain small amounts of data and what we call as interrupts okay are normally exchangeable between the devices and the cpu but largely the data that the cpu wants to access like for example i have pressed let us say a key now i press let us say a from my keyboard and that a is to be consumed by some program okay let us say some program was running and the program was doing a scan f then for the program to consume that data a the program's code which is running on the processor is not going to talk to my keyboard the data is going to flow through the ram so using some mechanism and we are going to learn that mechanism in this course actually the data of the keyboard will go into the ram and the program will actually access it from the ram okay that is how the whole computer system is architectured okay and this is called the von neumann architecture it is common to all the computers any questions so far i'll wait for questions okay so uh, you can ask questions in the chat box if you any questions try to later now this slide is an extremely extremely important slide you should not only memorize this slide you should keep recollecting this slide throughout this course and keep asking the questions that are raised on this slide again and again in order to understand how a computer works and how operating systems work so the question is what does the processor do so the from the moment you turn on your computer until you turn your computer off the cpu chip the processor your i3 i5 ryzen etc processors all of them simply do this one the fetch an instruction from the memory where is that particular instruction in the memory the location is given by the register called program counter then the inside the cpu chip processor the instruction will be decoded and executed maybe it's a add instruction a subtract instruction a move instruction i'm sure you are aware of these instructions that instruction will be decoded and executed while doing this it may fetch some data from the ram like if you are doing an add instruction and the add instruction has two numbers it is possible that those numbers are again in the ram and the more data will be fetched from the ram third step and actually the third step gets combined with the second step but while executing the earlier instruction itself the program counter is changed or updated now how is this update and change happening one simple thing is whenever you run a instruction the program counter gets incremented as a part of step 2 itself so if the program counter was let us say having a value of 1 uh, crore then after executing the instruction it will become 1 crore plus 4 most typically plus 4 because you know we say there are 32 bit computers and uh, you know on a 32 bit computer the program counter will increment by 4 okay. so the update happens automatically or there can be particular instructions like move instruction or sorry a jump instruction and so on which are basically aimed at changing the program counter value itself so no matter what the program counter changes and then you simply repeat the step number 1 so this is an infinite loop and your cpu is continuously in an infinite loop okay running this set of you know task continuously fetch decode execute change program counter go to one fetch decode execute 
change PC, go to one. That is what your CPU is continuously doing all the time. So now question. Obviously, this question should come to your mind. What is the initial value of the program counter when the pro computer starts? Like I said, it will fetch an instruction when the computer starts. That location is given by the program counter. But then what is the initial value of the program counter? Then the question is who puts that particular value in the program counter? And then what is there at the location given by the program counter, the initial location given by the program counter? So once again, I'll switch to the questions. And I'm going to ask you a next question. OK, so this is the question. Who determines the initial value of the program counter? So you can answer this question. And let me keep checking. So okay, I'll just move to some other side. So I don't want you to see the answers that are being given. All right, coming back. So these are the answers. The manufacturer of the CPU, the manufacturer of the motherboard, the end user, and most of the people are saying operating system. The right answer is the manufacturer of the CPU. Okay. The initial value of the program counter is not put into the place by the operating system. It is impossible. Why? So see, you bought the computer. Okay, you bought a, a bare metal hardware. Now, does it have a processor? Yes. Does the processor have a program counter? Yes. When you turn on that computer, which has no operating system on it, will the program counter have a value? Yes, it will have. And that is why the initial value of the program counter, which is put in there, you know, you know, it will have some value, the initial value. That cannot be put in there by the operating system because there is no operating system to begin with when you purchase a computer. So the answer is actually the manufacturer of the CPU. So it is Intel. Okay, which will decide that okay, if when you turn on this processor, the first value of the program counter will be this uh, hexadecimal 7775. It will say and it will actually document it in its documentation. So Intel gives a documentation, a heavy amount of documentation with its processes, and they mention the initial value of the program counter. So that is decided by the manufacturer of the CPU. And obviously, the end user has no, no role into it. Like you should have asked yourself. Have you ever specified the value of the program counter? You have never, right? You have used the computer so many times. So motherboard not correct. It's a CPU manufacturer. Because see, the same Intel, Intel processor will go into the motherboards of different vendors, right? And the value of the program counter will not change. It's put in there in the processor. All right, so we saw the answer to the second question. Now, the initial value of program counter, let us say some number, okay? It can be whatever number it is, it doesn't matter. The interesting question is the third question. What is there at the initial location given by the program counter? So it is basically some memory address, isn't it? It is some memory address. So what is there at that particular memory address, right? So we'll see an answer to that. So now the critical question that you need to keep thinking about, okay, throughout this course is, and with every concept throughout this course, Ask this, what is running on the processor? Remember, the CPU is continuously all the time running some instruction. So when I press the next key on this slide screen, I must be able to tell now what happened on the processor. Which instruction was running on the processor or you know, whatever instruction was running, it was a part of which program? What did the OS do? How did the OS come to run on the processor? How did my program come to run on the processor? How did the control pass on between my program and the OS and other components and so on? So we should be able to clearly see what is running on the processor every point in time. Who wrote that code? Which code ran before it and which code can run after it? So right now, let us say LibreOffice code is running on my processor. So I am running LibreOffice. Then what can run after LibreOffice? What could have run before LibreOffice? These are the questions we need to understand in order to get a good understanding of how operating system is built and how it runs. So we will keep revisiting these questions all the time. So basically, you try to understand the flow of instructions that execute on the processor. Right from the moment it is turned on till it is turned off, we should be able to tell everything that is happening on the processor. And as a part of that, we keep discovering and you know gaining a deeper understanding of the operating system. 
now few terms okay bios we have seen it yesterday initial lecture so bios is the code which is basically inbuilt into your hardware by the manufacturer bios stands for basic input output system now this is the code which runs automatically when you start computer how does it run the manufacturer will basically make sure that bios code is at that memory location which is the initial value of the program computer i repeat the manufacturer of your computer like hp or lenovo or dell or whatever they make the motherboard they put all the components onto it they also put in what you call as a rom a certain amount of read only memory that read only memory contains the code called basic input output system and they make sure that the address of the rom is the same as the initial value of the program counter so when you turned on your processor turned on your computer the program counter by default got the hardwired value of the whatever initial value and that particular location in memory contains the bios code so your computer immediately starts running the bios code that's how your computer starts okay now what does the bios code do the bios code runs okay it does some initialization it initializes hardware and so on you might have seen you know the logo of the manufacturer like the hp logo or dell logo will flash and you will see some instruction like press f12 press escape press f10 for boot menu and etc so that is all bios code running after doing all this the bios code will look up hardware it will initialize hardware now what is meant by initializing hardware and all we will see we will actually see an example we will see the code of this and so on uh, but uh, ultimately what does the bios do it keeps looking for another program and the program called bootloader it is looking for that program so that it can take the bootloader code and put it into the ram and then pass on the control to that code so that bios keeps looking for this so if you can recollect yesterday i gave you a demo of installing windows and ubuntu in a dual boot mode and the initial error if you remember i got was that you know no bootable disk found and if you can't recollect please go back to that video and see it again so that error was given by the bios the bios was looking for something called as a bootloader and it could not find it what is a bootloader bootloader is a program which most typically exists on a secondary storage like a hard disk or a cd or a flash drive or pen drive or something most typically on you know the first sector the sector 0 of that particular device it is a program which is most typically loaded by the bios in ram and then the bios will say jump to this so the last instruction in the bios code will be jump to the code of the the bootloader so now the bootloader will start running so see the way it, it it works is like baton passing i'm sure you have seen a relay a relay race you know the uh, there is a baton and there are four people running in sequence and the first person give the baton to the second the second to the third and so on that is how these people are working now the bios is passing on the baton to the bootloader and saying now you run okay so and how is that practically done using a instruction like a jump or a call ultimately at the end of the bios code so now the control jumps into the bootloader the bootloader has been brought into the ram by the bios okay and where is the bootloader bootloader is most typically on a cd or on a hard disk or on a mm, pen drive so for example grub okay yesterday we saw a grub screen so that grub is a bootloader most typically the grub that you run is on the hard disk sector 0 that sector is called as the boot sector and the code sits on the sector 0 when you boot from a bootable pen drive then basically what are what are you doing you are telling your bios to boot from the pen drive the bios will load the sector 0 code of the pen drive into the ram and then pass on the control to that code which was loaded from the boot sector of the pen drive so that is the bootloader from the pen drive and so on now what is the job of the bootloader the job of the bootloader is to pass on the backend to the os kernel so the bootloader's job is to locate the code of os kernel load it in the ram and pass control over to it so the backend passing is from bios to the bootloader and then the bootloader to the os each of them loads the code of the next one into the ram and then uh, keep start executing it now just introducing you to certain terms fine these terms were introduced yesterday also and i'll finish with this what is a kernel kernel is basically that particular piece of code once again that you never see in execution okay you know you never see it with a naked eyes it is the code that gets loaded and given control by the bios initially when the computer boots it takes control of the hardware how we will see you know in next few lectures how does the kernel take control of the hardware then it creates an environment so that your programs can run like this libreoffice is running firefox is running 
for them to run it creates an environment an environment which is much better than the processor's environment it will control access to the hardware by applications and so on so on everything else is applications so everything that is running on your computer is either the kernel or an application that's how we we, we distinguish it either the code is kernel code or it's an application code now it so happens that there are certain application programs which we call as system programs these are applications which depend heavily on the kernel and the processor their code is heavily dependent on the processor and the cpu for example the compiler linker loader etc they are heavily dependent on the processor and the, CPU, the kernel so that is why we call them system program but remember they are also applications because they are not kernel and then there are other applications and yesterday we saw some questions on this the gui the terminal the libre office firefox we'll see and so on and in, in fact your own programs like you wrote some programs in data structures in ppl in c and they were all applications okay so there is a clear cut distinction between the kernel world and the application world and i'll basically stop with this diagram and we will keep rediscovering this diagram how is a computer system now built computer systems are built using the layering principle what is the layering principle the same principle which you have studied so many times in your life that there is a function which calls another function and then there are there is a third function which calls the second function and the fourth function and then higher level functionality will call the lower level functionality so basically at the lowest level we have the computer hardware which gives us certain basic features using them an operating system is built and using which the system and application programs are not only built but executable and so on and we as end users just interact with the application programs now here in this diagram they distinguish between system and application programs i just want to emphasize that all system programs are applications okay only for the sake of convenience people often say system programs and application programs technically from the perspective of operating system programmer there is no distinction between a system program and an application program they are same for us they are application programs okay so i'll stop with this and this this thing we will cover the smp and all in next few lectures we will stop now if there are questions remaining then you can ask them on the forum it's time now it is 1 o'clock so we should stop sir do we have lab today yes you have lab today at what time 1:30 or 2 uh at around 2 we will start today okay sir